um, in the way that your film describes the perspective from the point of view of the machine, um, how much do we fetishize technologies that we don't know the inner workings of? And I don't say we all don't know the inner workings of, because obviously some of us do, but some of us don't. And where does that sit in, the, in your conversation with the scientist about dystopian science fiction futures or utopian science fiction futures? How much of that is wrapped up in a knowing or not knowing the workings of the machine? Uh, well, for me, I think, well, I'm particularly interested in the idea of the black boxed machine, actually. Mm. Um, and, and we all carry around these things in our pockets, these smartphones. And I think that they're a great example of these fetishized objects, the, the Apple iPhone, for example. And we don't look inside, and we don't know what it means. And I think there's, there's a writer called Timothy Morton who's came up with this idea of the hyper object, uh, which I think is a particularly interesting idea when you apply it to technology of any sort, any kind of black boxed technology, any, of the, any, any type of machine. Uh, and, and, and if you think, and the, uh, basically the idea of the hyper object is that if you un unwrap a black box or depunctualize any kind of technology, there's this incredibly complex narrative and mesh behind it which is kind of made up of human and non-human moving parts. Uh, and so for a mobile phone, you'll find that the capacitor is you know, made out of coltan, it's mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it has this huge impact on people, on the mountain gorilla population, all, all, all of these things unravel. Um, then of course the whole thing is uh, taken apart in an e-waste site, and that's where it ends its life and, and all, all of these other things. Uh, so the true narrative of devices and the cloud and all these, these ideas that we, we kind of base our lives around of, of the virtual are, are, very, are very different narratives if you, if, you, if you kind of research them and look at them in more detail. So, mm. so, so, so for me, that's, is that kind of answering your question? Yeah. I think, did you have yeah, some, some more? Yeah, I mean, um, go ahead, Alan, yeah. Um, who do you imagine your audience is and do you expect to have a political impact with these types of films or are you just trying to inform uh, the, well, for me, this project was was different because I because I, I was I knew that the audience was going to be very mixed. It, so it's not it's not a kind of traditional gallery art audience necessarily. The project has gone to a lot a lot of different places. So the audience was very broad, um, and there were lots of workshops with young people and all these kind of things. So the idea was to really try and make a project that does inform people, is a little bit playful, you know, has some kind of humour in it as well. The, you know, that the machine is imperfect, that's delivering the voiceover of, of the film, its voice crackles, and at the end it kind of all goes wrong, you know, so, so, it has, so, so the idea was to, by doing that, by kind of drawing the audience in, inform them about new things that are going on, get them to question the eth their own personal ethics of how far they want their code fixed. We know all about all the useful and good things we can do with, with uh, research into, in, into genetics, but how far do we want to go with that? How far as humans do we want to go? That, that, that was the kind of thing I wanted to do, so to start conversations. It so, seems to me that a lot of your work is aimed at, it has a political message behind it. Absolutely. But you don't seem to be emphasising that at all. Uh, so you talk about influencing people, but you know, do you want to influence politicians? Do you want to influence no, because I think, I think the space of a gallery is a, is a space where you can explore ideas. And that's, that's a useful thing. A, and a museum is one of the only places where you can explore and vocalize philosophies and other ideas that you can't do out, out, outside. So it's not about becoming an activist because that's a separate separate thing, but it's about opening up discussions about these ideas. So you don't see yourself as a political activist? Trying to get message from you? Right? Uh, not, not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I found interesting about this movie was that the tone of the narrator, the hybrid machine, is very neutral. Um, a lot of science fiction or portrayal of near technology and computers and the way they interact with us is either very subservient, yeah. very negative, or very aggressive, or sometimes you know eager to please and positive. Whereas this seemed very neutral and not not indifferent because it was clearly important to the narrator, but quite neutral. Yes, is that a very deliberate reflection of your stance on technology. It was, yeah. The interaction it, of us and technology. It was, yeah, because because I'm a big fan of technology. Uh, so why was it more but positive? I, but I have a but I have a kind of love hate relationship with it. So so I wanted the voice to be quite neutral. I didn't want it to be 
completely dystopian kind of kind of thing, saying technology is bad, this is bad, you know, at all. But I wanted it to kind of open up what the audience like might experience. Way, yes. On how you felt about a particular moment yeah, yeah. In the, the film, which I thought was one yeah. of Okay, no, that's interesting, that's good. Because, yeah, I, yeah that, that's kind of what I was trying to do with it. So, yeah. I, was, so I was trying to be quite open with this piece of work. I always want to ask a question about one of your previous projects when you said you were working with this local community. Did yeah. any of the discussions actually have an impact on what happened in that community or was it just like a hypothetical um, activity? Uh, no, it was a, a kind of... Well, the organisation I was working with, their whole kind of manifesto in a way is to work with the community. So, so all of their projects do in lots of ways have an impact on the community because they actively work with them. So they don't have a gallery space, they have a kind of site where they have, they have kind of artists and all sorts of creative people come and uh, spend time and come up with projects that have to engage with the community in some way. So there were local people that spoke at my event that made things, that there were, there were, there were people that were interested in permaculture that were trying it out. So, so all these different people that kind of added up to being able to do things in a different way, so that, that was the kind of idea behind it. So, so it was really bringing these people together and then discussing some of these ideas from a book that they would never have seen. It's highly unlikely they've seen that book, uh, which is kind of the sort of book you might find in a gallery shop maybe or something, or, you know. Uh, so, so, so I think that was the impact that that particular project would have. Uh, we also had a very mixed audience of local people, uh, students from different local colleges, and, and students from art colleges as well. So, so, it was, so, so I think as, as a whole, that project had a kind of interesting impact of discussion. But uh, the wider impact of the organisation is that they're embedded in the community in Cumbria. And they do all sorts of kind of projects that, that cross, cross over there. Because their idea is to always, is to try and be useful with, with art. So that's, that's what they do. And it's, a, it's similar to the idea of, uh, is it Mima, Ms. Middlesbrough? Yeah. yeah. And in fact, one of the people from Bryce Arts works in, in Mima Mid runs Mima Mid Middlesbrough now, so with the same kind of ethos of usefulness. So I'm just curious, how, through all the projects, how did you manage to include all different perspectives, for, for example, from just ordinary people on the street, or maybe just yourself, or maybe the scientists or engineer behind the technology? How you include all the different perspectives into the video or any books you're trying to produce. Or at the end, so as an output, what do you think from the original perspective? So what kind of output did you try to achieve at the end? Well, so which project you, with, with this? Uh, precisely like uh, the project with local community and also the project, the video you are doing uh, about the ghost city in China. <coughs> Um, well, the one okay, so so maybe I'll talk about yeah. So so the ghost city one in China. So so what you you want to know how yeah, it yeah, so connects? Yeah, so we managed to bring different point of view into the final work you produce. Um, well, I think the ghost the, the one in the ghost city was well, you know that was a video that was shown in galleries. Okay, but it connected with that final project that I talked about, which is the, the signal and the noise, which which was about e-waste sites that are in China and stuff like that. And, and, and I guess I, I didn't really say how that project has manifested. So it manifested as a kind of lecture uh, where I talk about a whole, whole journey of what happens uh, once you kind of take a, take, a, take a smartphone apart and what the kind of real narratives are of, of, of all the parts that make it up. Um, and I guess I've given that lecture in different formats in different places. So, so I've, I've also given it in Beijing uh, to loads of Chinese students who didn't know anything about uh, the kind of e-waste sites in Guiyu in, Ch in China, for example. So I think that was a kind of interesting uh, discussion, maybe, based around the work. So, that, so that's maybe one thing. Um, and as far as the project in uh, Cumbria is concerned, uh, yeah, that was part of, part of a, a load of different projects that the organisation was organising themselves. So, so I think in terms of the impact that that achieves, it's it's a small part of what they were doing, so so it contributed to their overall kind of strategy of of working with artists and the local community on on kind of projects that are useful to them in some way, or bring people together in new ways, or take on ideas from that people haven't heard about before and kind of repackage them together 
and, and actually try them out in, in, in a real way. So they have a farm where they grow experimental pl plant it, planting and all these kind of things. Uh, so, so there's lots of things they're doing that, that are kind of real things, yeah. But I think part of the question goes to the role of the artist and your own subjectivity yeah. and the perspectives of other um, collaborators and at what point you retreat to your studio and you put your own spin on it and at what point you fold in others' voices because you did talk at the beginning about a book that's made entirely from appropriated material. So yes. I guess there is a question there about your own process of balancing or shaping Absolutely. and your own subjective process as yeah. an artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think, no, that, that's a good point. So yeah, so for me, the process in making a film like that, for example, is a very much a honing process of doing a lot of research into all the perspectives, talking with Darren and his colleagues, and then obviously bringing in some angles of my own research and my own thinking about technology and the ethics around technology and all these kind of things. So, so it's not completely open, but I do try and arrange it so it, has, it triggers a discussion. So, so I think of it more as a performance that I expect feedback from. That, that, that's kind of how I think of those videos. So I don't think of them as straightforward short films that you might show uh, in a cinema or, or a film festival or something. I think of them as performances and, and the kind of, I guess, I guess I didn't show it at the beginning, but maybe I've got it here. Here we go. So yeah, so, and why I say that is that the work I used to do was with this alter ego. So that is me in a hole in Switzerland. <laughs> And I used to make these performances that were proposals for, for new ways of doing things. And they were discussions as well. So this was in Bern, in Switzerland, um, as I said. And, and, and the whole proposal was for, for building an under, underground community in Bern, uh, underground. It was relating to the fact that they were, they were storing uh, and keeping a lot of people that they, they didn't want everyone to know about in kind of un underground bunkers in the mountains. So I was kind of referring to that as well. Um, but yeah, so this project was, was, was like a lot of projects I used to do. So it was about having a discussion with the audience, presenting some, some ideas that were, that, that were quite extreme, quite undermining things, uh, quite tying into people's fears and anxieties about various issues, uh, and then seeing what they say. But again, they were presented in a very straight-faced way by this quite silly character. Uh, and by having this silly character, people would talk to you and they would, they would have a discussion about, about these more complex issues. So, so for me, the films I'm making now still use a similar device mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the way I kind of construct them. So there is some humour, there is, there is some, some theories, there is some kind of angles, there is a dystopianness to them, of course, but it's about having a discussion, basically. The Signal and Noise started in 2013, the end of it. That's when we first met the scientists, I think. Um, but yeah, that was, it's obviously been quite a long project, going through different rounds of, uh, rounds of funding applications and things like this. Um, but yeah, the first part for me is, is getting embedded in research. So I might end up with a document of text, which is from all sorts of research I've done around, in this case, around Darren's particular work around genetically influenced behavior, about me trying to understand the coding in genetics and, and to, to also think, think about uh, how my ideas connect with it uh, and, so, and so really I would do loads and loads of research and then talk back to Darren about it so it was a kind of two-way process um, and it was an area that I didn't know anything about uh, so, so it, was a, it was quite hard at first but I find embedding yourself in research and just doing a lot of it you start developing a kind of language from it uh, and, I, and, and for me a lot of my work it, as well is about writing really so, so I have all this material uh, and then I go through a process of kind of pulling out stuff, appropriating some words. And then I obviously in this film used a lot of uh, language from computing. So all of the delivery of that script is, is very much computing language and it's applying it to people and other things, right? So, so that's when I started to develop that language and hone it down. So from a kind of working document that was probably 30 pages long, I end up with a script, you know, that's page and a half long, so it's really a process of, of filtering stuff down and working through it and discussing more with Darren and then running the script past him. So, so, it, so I would say, yeah, that project took quite a long time. So it was finished at 
the start of this year, the end of last year. So, so yeah, so it took a couple of, couple of, couple of years, basically. Um, and also, I, in terms of the visual material I used, that went through a similar process. So a lot of it is appropriated. A lot of it is from various archives. Some of it is from Darren himself. Some of it was made with him when he looked at certain things and, and, sh and, and showed me how to get video content from, from them, from new ones and stuff like this. Uh, so it's a real mixture of material. So I did kind of try to also keep to the methods I've used in other projects of having a diverse range of clips, uh, not, not kind of pretending that I'm suddenly just an animator or, or whatever. So, so I, I did really kind of stick to that. So it's, so it's a, an amalgamation of lots of things and a real honing process to, to try and get it to be what you want it to be. So it's not dissimilar to doing painting. <laughs> Seen film okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess a, a key thing in, in science is replication. So I kind of wonder um, how different you think it might be if you had done the interaction rather than not only with Darren but another scientist at the same campus but upstairs. In the That's interesting. Yeah. Um, how much is it? The generics of modern Well, I think it would have been very different, actually, because because I ended up really not focusing that much on Darren's research. And I, I should say the film was originally called Unencrypting Fear, and it was it was really it was going to focus more on what he was doing with being able to switch off the fear gene in mice, you know, and so so that they would not run away from a rat. And it was all about smell and you know everything else. Uh, but I wanted to move past that and he was very um, keen to move past that and very keen to focus on the technology and I don't think most of the scientists would have been so open to doing that and I think it was because he's got really an interest in the possibilities of technology and so he really did keep on telling me about new things that were developing and changing and he, and he wanted to build them into the script so, so I can't think that it would have been the same project at all with someone else in, in his building necessarily. But, you know, I can't, I can't tell. <laughs> so there's an interesting kind of juxtaposition between the film and the items, because the, the technology, or the, the viewer in the film, is very anthropomorphic, even down to the two circles that seem like eye holes in a mask or something. Like yeah, so yeah, yeah. The computer, and you even talked about it being a kind of computer biological hybrid. So it's very yeah. anthropomorphic, it's very part us, part them. But the objects and the objects that produce the data, things like the sequencing machines, are not anthropomorphic. No. It's not clear to me that the direction that technology development is taking in our world is to make technology more anthropomorphic. No. Necessarily. No, not necessarily. So was that anthropomorphism a deliberate choice or was it kind of an accidental falling into choice? Because if you want to have a computer to speak and interact with an audience, we kind of try and force them to be more human rather than just be machines. Uh, yeah, well, it, it, it was a choice. It was a choice, yeah. And I, and, I, and I know that that kind of idea of hybrid computing is only one idea of many of, of where that technology will go. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to kind of bring the two together, the, the, human, the human code and the machine code and the idea of those kind of cutouts, so shapes. Why did you make the choice? Because I think, I think it makes it quite unnerving a little bit, right? Yeah. You, you, you don't know if the computer's kind of treading on your your ground as a human. Yes. So it's almost that it makes you a little bit anxious, which ties into your yeah. thing about well, fear. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if that was the intention. That, 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 well, that kind of is the intention, yeah. So that's the, that's, that's the fear bit. That's the, that's the dystopia bit that, you know, that's, that, that's there. Um, the idea was that the transmission is coming from a kind of code space. I'm not saying what that space is, but where the, where the codes are all kind of joined together or, or interacting with each other. And those cutout holes might be from that. Uh, they might be from other things, looking closely at things. But that was kind of the, the idea behind it. So yeah, 